So tonight, we're going to uh, take the black horse. The four horsemen of Revelation 6, of course, have become very well known, even in secular literature. The secular literature typically deals with them quite symbolically, but in any case, um, uh, tonight we're going to explore the, the implications, if you will, of Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And in Revelation, as you know, in chapter 6, we're opening the first of the seven sealed of the sealed book. And in Revelation chapter 6, we have the seals. And when you get down to verse 5, you're opening the third seal. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I beheld in lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A measure of wheat for a denarius, three measures of barley for a denarius, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. That's it. That's all we know from the text on the third horseman. Now, what does this imagery suggest? He's carrying a pair of balances uh, in his hand. That was a standard thing to measure uh, goods and, and, and money and so forth. The announcement goes out that there's a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny, or a denarius, if you will. It is widely, I think, generally agreed among most conservative scholars that the idiom here speaks of inflation and famine. It may come as a surprise to many to recognize the linkage between those two. Because what this uh, speaks toward is that we have uh, a denarius was nominally a day's wage. Someone could work uh, his full wage and get just a, one meal. Unless it was a very economy meal for, his, for three, in other words, you could barely make it, if that. He didn't have anything left over for all the other needs of life. So it does imply inflation. It also implies famine. And that's what we're going to uh, really focus on uh, today. We will talk about famine on the planet Earth. But before we do that, we want to lay some groundwork, which may surprise you. I think all of us have, have heard or read of the various famines in various parts of the world at various times, even today, going on. It may surprise you to discover that most 20th century famines are man-made. Most 20th century famines are man-made. And they caused either deliberately or by economic systems that were crippled by corrupt or dictatorial governments. It's interesting that most famines are not caused by nature or the inability of people to produce food, but rather by the policies of governments that are looking out for their own self-centered interests. Through all that, make it impossible for the people to cope with nature or uh, to gather and produce food. One of the most commonly known modern examples of this was the deliberately induced famines imposed by Joseph Stalin in order to, uh, in the, on the Ukraine, to force the population into compliance. It's interesting that the horseman here uh, speaks of not just famine at the outs onset of the tribulation, but an economic condition where a man's daily wages are so small that he can barely support himself and his family. In essence, the horrible economic conditions and the specter of famine are interrelated in the end times. They're interrelated today and they're clearly interrelated in the end times. Now, it's interesting as, you, as we get into this, you'll discover that the conditions for global famine are almost uniquely being positioned as we speak for a global famine. Normally famines have been very regionalized, very localized, but it's going to be much, much broader. And it's interesting that almost exclusively in modern times, famines derive from monetary inflation. And that may come as a real surprise. Now, as we get into this, we should try to develop a certain precision, if we can, in our vocabulary. We speak, of course, of recessions, uh, economic recessions, or depressions even, and or expansions. That's an economic term. When we speak of inflation or deflation, we're speaking of monetary terms. We live in an economic system where goods are exchanged for various things. We also, what's also a part of that system or a, a parallel system is the monetary system. And these systems don't necessarily stay in sync. 
So one of the things that many people are confused by is the difference between the monetary and the economic models. And we're, we want to be sensitive to that as we go. The economic model is what's really going on, real goods and services. The monetary system is, the, is what's happening to the measurement elements by which we measure what's going on. Imagine trying to do a, build a house or do some construction if your yardsticks were constantly changing length, if they were elastic somehow. Wouldn't work. One of the things that we depend on is precision and, and uniformity, if you will, of our measures. And that's one of the, the things that really corrupts our societies when our basic units are tampered with, manipulated uh, by special interests. Now, we currently have a, a major economic crisis, financial crisis, in Asia. And it's portrayed by the media as an economic crisis. But it really isn't. The economy in Asia was booming over the past few years. We've heard a lot about the Asian tiger economy, if you will. And uh, so why, of a sudden, why all of a sudden is there an economic crisis? In reality, Asia is experiencing a currency crisis, not an economic crisis. I mean, one may derive from the other, obviously, but the point is, is that um, this idea that there's ongoing booms and busts, uh, symptomatic of our society, is uh, caused primarily by what we're going to get into a little bit, fractional reserve banking. Quite often, the media and the academics speak of the boom and bust cycle as if it's something that um, is just a normal part of economic activity, and that's not true. The only part of the culture that's... Uh, what really causes it is the manipulation of the uh, money supply, and that manipulation today is worldwide. See, in the past, it was the manipulation was really constrained to a particular regime, a particular country. But today, because of the way the world's moving, the entire global economy is subject to manipulation, and that will lead to all its attendant evils. We're really going to step back even one step further, because most people, not just Christians, although they're certainly guilty of it, most people do not really understand money. They don't understand the nature, the role of the money in society. If we're ignorant about how money really operates, it will lead to the forfeiture of our freedoms and our private property. It'll be a fundamental encumbrance on our stewardship. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, of just the basics. And money is, strangely enough, probably one of the most important fundamental inventions uh, of mankind. Obviously, the love of money leads to greed and other sins, and so very appropriately, we're cautioned in the scripture that the love of money is the root of all evil. But because of that, many Christians overreact and really close their eyes and their, their understanding to try and understand what is money really. We want to start with that because uh, what is money? How do you define money? And uh, see, without it, a complex um, modern economy, which is based on the division of labor, the exchange of goods and services, it would be impossible. If it wasn't for some money or a money substitute, all of us would have to do all that we need for ourselves. But because of money and, and what it leads to, it allows specializa job specialization, allows us to develop professions, allows us to develop special skills, knowing that we can trade those skills for other things that we need. So it turns out that's a very basic prerequisite. The best definition that economists seem to have been able to devise is that money is the most re uh, marketable commodity in a particular society. Money is the most marketable. Anything you have that is widely marketable can be a money, a money substitute, if you will. That's probably why gold has emerged in the earliest records as one of the popular mechanisms to serve as a unit of value. It served that role for obviously many thousands of years. Uh, no seller of gold has ever had to stand begging in the streets, begging people to buy it. People would it, had, it was able to maintain an intrinsic value for a number of reasons we'll go through. There was a time, of course, in primitive culture, still are today, where barter is a form of a, uh, of a business. I'll trade you two sheep for your cow or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. And that obviously uh, is clumsy, awkward. Sooner or later, we want to start getting into something as an intermediate form of barter. And that's really where the whole idea of money uh, came. And I won't go through a whole historical development. Obviously, you can go through a whole list of things that were used as uh, money. Large donut-shaped stones were used by certain tribes. Seashells. Even women were used for barter and, or for as money. And uh, some of these things have proved practical, some have not. How do you go to the supermarket and uh, for something that costs one and a half women, you know? <laughs> and um, first of all, my staff suggested that only Solomon could deal with a situation like that for two reasons. 
he had plenty of women, and he had a lot of experience uh, in dividing things up. So, <laughs> and of course, we're being facetious here. As economies developed and money was needed more and more, uh, ordinary trade gravitated to the use of metals, various metals. Although cowrie shells were used in Africa for a long, long time. They even used large stones in certain islands, island the Pacific Island of the Yap. Pretty soon, though, even the conveyance of coinage or, or metals or some other, or other some form of money gets inconvenient. And so it isn't very long before you see the emergence of certificates of ownership substituting. A certificate that somehow authenticated that uh, is a uh, evidence of ownership. You don't actually have to have the gold with you. You can use a certificate that's uh, the equivalent, or gold, or whatever that whatever acceptable uh, intermediate form of value, storage of value could be done. Coinage, coinage itself was probably invented in China, and then reinvented by the Lydians in Turkey. Paper currency also had its origin. That's a whole other development, but also probably uh, uh, well before the 11th century in China. Ancient Babylon had a very, very sophisticated monetary system and also uh, banks and credit. So did Greece, so did Rome. The ancient empires have evidence of having very sophisticated forms of monetary units and forms of credit and banking. Some of that seemed to die out in the Dark Ages, but reemerged in about the 9th century in Europe, and uh, won't go through all of that. But the one of the things to recognize is that money does, uh, was very essential in some very fundamental cultural ways because it allowed job specialization, it allowed uh, urbanization, it caused mankind to graduate out of simply an agrarian envi uh, professional environment. And so you could be expert in one area knowing that you could trade that expertise probably with leverage uh, on other things you needed. Well, what is money really? What, what, what are the characteristics? What makes money? It takes at least five things. It should be divisible. Money should be capable of being divided, subdivided into small units in order to count things. Otherwise, it's impossible to make changes and so forth. That's pretty obvious. It needs recognizability. Um, everyone using it has to recognize uh, its intrinsic value or won't accept in trade. One of the problems with, say, for example, gold or silver is that uh, if it's getting into serious transactions, you've got a possibility of being defrauded by its impurity or so forth. You, know, you have a, a validation phase to go through if, it isn't, if there aren't some kind of enforced standards. A third thing is portability. You've got to be able to carry it around. And obviously large stones or women had some limitations in daily transactions. So obviously certificates can be a substitute and of course they can be actually traded as, as money, obviously subject to certain risks. Durability, money has to last. Candle wax would probably not work too well. Or you, know, you can think of examples that are obviously impractical because they would be a nuisance to keep replacing, etc. and so on. And scarcity. Can't be something that's everywhere. Sand on the seashore won't work because it's too easily accessible. It can't store a value. Anyone can go get some. In other words, it has to have some aspect of scarcity in order to hold the value. What's interesting, as you really get sophisticated in your analysis, you'll discover that modern money that you and I are saddled with fails all five tests. Fortunately, it's not obvious to anyone, uh, to everyone, and so it still works to an extent, but we want to examine its frailties. And of course, obviously, as you study money, you discover the the advantages of gold, its purity, its uh, usefulness for certain things, and yet scarcity uh, has made it through history, through thousands of years, a, a relatively reliable uh, mechanism for money, for monetary use. Now, it's interesting, the Bible seems to bear this out. You may recall Abram's servant gave uh, Rebecca gifts um, of gold in order to entice her to, as part of the package, to come from uh, Laban's family to, uh, to become the bride of Isaac. Um, when the Israelites fled Egypt, uh, they obviously, uh, God commanded them to collect as repayment for the long servitude, uh, jewels of gold and silver. Exodus chapter 3 deals with some of this. He warned the Israelites not to uh, make gods of silver and gold, as is the common practice among the pagans in that day and the pagans in this day. But, <laughs> of course, the tabernacle had uh, its most precious elements uh, emblazoned or, or made of gold as a Levitical symbol of holiness, of purity, and so forth. And we could go to lots of other examples. The uh, value of metal money was pretty straightforward. You weighed so much gold or whatever it was, and it determined its value, its weight, its, its weight and purity. Uh, we even find the scriptures mentioning a talent of silver, talent being a measurement of weight, if you will. As early as the 6th century before Christ, governments are issuing coins that are gold, silver, or copper, obviously with varying values. This coinage system was both a religious as well as a political phenomenon.
each of the city states, there were cities, but the cities in those days were like a city state, had its own coinage, its own, had its own local political monopoly over the money. And so did the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire emerges as a republic and then an empire, uh, it did the same thing. It's interesting that the Roman Empire was a religious organization. All ancient societies were, and uh, even our modern societies, although they tried to hide the fact. The emperors ultimately being uh, designated as gods, and later uh, even t some of them took that quite seriously. And the coins, of course, were used as religious as well as political devices. Now, in, in an illiterate world, uh, the uh, images on the coins, of course, carried religious and political messages. And Tiberius's picture on the uh, coin given to Jesus uh, when he was Caesar is, of course, a well-known example in the scripture. As nations start to mint coins, there's a subtle shift in the nature of money. It becomes something more than just an economic unit. It starts to become, it starts to have a specification that carries with it uh, more than just the weight of the gold or silver, but the, con the, the image, if you will, of the government that's issuing it. And uh, if they had confidence in the government administration, there was no problem. But also, to the extent that eroded, they had a problem. It's interesting, that started to allow the governments to begin to debase their currency. Instead of a dollar's worth of gold and a dollar coin, using it just idiomatically, uh, they could cheat and make it lighter. And no one really cared as long as it was considered authentic and would be, ex the, the basis was strictly acceptability. If I get you to take one of those coins, it might not have full value of gold in the coin. You didn't care it was a unit of measure because you know you could give it to the next person. It was acceptable for traffic. But the minute that happens, you see, the governments then can begin to cheat. They can trade on the general confidence in the government to debase the currency, make the currency itself lacking intrinsic value. No government on the face of the earth has ever, in the historical record, succeeded in resisting that temptation. Not even the United States would come through that. They went from a gold-backed currency, silver-backed currency, and then finally a no-backed currency. By debasing the currency, the government could spend more and accomplish things and empower itself. And, uh, uh, and it would take time for the economy to recognize that the currency had less value. If, uh, uh, to give you an example, a very crude example, but to get a, the idea across, let's assume we could put, we could consider in a box all goods and services of an island or a, an economy. And let's assume there's a certain amount of currency in circulation that equals the value of that, those goods and services. If I double the amount of currency, I don't create a new value. I simply, any unit of value of what's there will be, have to be represented by twice as much of the currency. So conceptually, it's quite obvious. But in practical terms, there's always a time delay. If uh, I have goods and services in the economy, and I start adding synthetic money to the economy, it causes inflation. There's no change in the goods and services. It, it bring, comes about because of the uh, debasement of the currency. We'll get into some of that a little better as we go. Uh, all the governments had to do is start mixing lower level metals with their coins. That started the corruption. Started, it was a form of stealing from the people, in effect. And um, they, the Roman emperors took silver out of the denarii. Copper was substituted. It wasn't long before the citizens caught on. And it wasn't very long where that all started to have it uh, come apart. There was a, uh, the principle that became very obvious was recognized by Sir Thomas Gresham, who was an official in the court of Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, he said, bad money drives good money out of circulation. In other words, if there's two kinds of money circulating, the good stuff you'll hoard. You see, and you'll take that, the, the bad stuff you'll give it up. So it turns out pretty soon the bad money is, uh, 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 drives the good money out of circulation. The good money is being hoarded by people. It's no longer in circulation. So the, there's more and more. As, as they debase it, it gets, it gets worse and worse. So one of the things that happens when, that, when there's two kinds of currencies, the government, where well, you have a two-tier, what's called a two-tier <coughs> currency, uh, the government, of course, if it's debasing this, you'll end up with two sets of prices if you've got the if you've got something to sell, and there's two kinds of currencies, you'll have a price whether it's good or bad money. Government won't like that, and that so they'll try to make that illegal. And when, the minute you have the government tampering there, of course, uh, that creates stresses and that uh, thwarts the economy. Historically, these two-tier systems get uh, legislated by most governments under penalty of death. 
government's very, very jealous of its monopoly on the money. If that's the case, then of course, the, with, the, with the bad money coming in, the prices keep getting higher and higher, inflation takes place, and, that, and that's exactly what happened in Rome and, all, and virtually all empires since. From the time that Tiberius began minting his denarii, uh, it was about three centuries later, the Romans increasingly debased their coinage, uh, substituting tin-plated copper and such. And by 300 AD, the denarius was made out of totally worthless base metals. So then they took the next step to control the, pub the public's reaction to all of this and started imposing price controls. About 301 AD, Emperor Diocletian uh, imposed wage and price controls, the violation of which was punishable by death. And uh, so this, this is, the whole empire obviously is on its path to uh, corruption. It's interesting, in Professor Stauffer's book, Christ and the Caesars, he really chronicles the story of the collapse of the Roman Empire through a study of the progressively debased coinage. And as the empire collapsed, so does the coinage. If increased spending and increased taxation could save an economy, Rome would still be ruling the world. Think about that. Obviously, the inflation and the associated price controls brought on other kinds of woes. Quality and uh, quantity of goods began to decline. Black markets formed to skirt the controls. Police power was brought in to combat that. And productivity declines. Jobs and businesses are lost. The whole thing you know, augurs in uh, pretty quickly. The shortages are usually exacerbated then with uh, attempts at rationing and other things, and, and uh, on it goes. And the longer the government has the price controls in effect, the, greater, the deeper the harm occurs. Price controls are essentially people controls. Governments imposing them assume the power to make the decisions that the people should be left alone to make for themselves. In August 15th of 1971, inflation was uh, lowering the value of the dollar by over 4% a year. President Nixon slapped wage and price controls on the nation, and for three years that program caused all kinds of predictable problems. When governments are armed with those kinds of powers, you uh, you know, seeking violators and the rest of it. Uh, you have, well, you have some of that today, even with the uh, environmental kinds of controls they're attempting. You have, you start, you're, you're moving towards a police state. The American people are gradually getting conditioned to accept that kind of thing, but you're moving step by step towards fasci fascism. The Nixon's uh, poorly enforced program was scrapped finally. Prices still had ra risen 10% despite all the rules. And 97% uh, of the U.S. corporations were experiencing unusual difficulties in getting uh, supplies. The price controls didn't solve any problems. They just became an additional problem on top of everything else. Now, it turns out that uh, prices will invariably, uh, rising prices will invariably des destroy people's confidence in the money system. And that loss of confidence is um, reflected in their loss of confidence in the state itself. They go together. And uh, we can expect more and more of that here. This gets into a whole topic of governmental cheating and the response of the populations against that. But if we start on that, we'll be here all night. <laughs> Governments quickly find out it's cheaper to print a piece of paper with some dead politician's face on it than it is to mine gold two miles under the earth. And so being cheaper, of course, is too big a temptation for politicians not to resort to that in order to uh, accomplish whatever they're trying to accomplish. Suppose you um, earn $10 for something uh, that you sold or some work you performed. And you receive a $10 bill in exchange for your work. That represents the value of the service you performed. It also means that the current, the current market price, that $10, will buy X amount of goods or services. But suppose the government comes along with another $10 bill. Looks just like yours, spends just like yours. Um, the only difference is that government expended nothing to create that $10 uh, bill except the small amount of paper and ink. You had to work for yours, it prints it for free. What just happened to your $10, uh, that ju your, your $10 in your hand just became worth five, in effect. Well, you may not realize it, but it does. And uh, you may not have noticed anything that happened. And because both $10 bills now will buy the same amount that the earlier one did before that was introduced. And so you're, the, the, you have, that's the basic dynamic. It's amazing how few people really understand that. So it's, when prices go up, it doesn't mean that the goods or services are worth more. It means it takes more currency to buy the same good. You follow me? And it's amazing how many people do not understand that inflation is a monetary thing, not an economic thing. Your, your $10 worth of work what was, it hasn't changed. It's what people are willing to pay in terms of the, the media.
it's amazing how many ostensibly competent sources are really uh, confused on this point. You and I are told that inflation is a normal part of a econ healthy economy, and that's a falsehood. It's a normal part of an economy when the monetary system has no sound basis. The biggest problem with inflation is that it continually erodes uh, the value of money that's in, in, uh, that we hold. And we constantly have to keep making more money to stay even, if you will. It's sort of like the, what is it, the rabbit and Alice. You've got to keep running to stay in place. And I could go through some examples here, but let's just take one very, very simple. Your dollar in 1940 would buy that which you would have to pay more than $10 today. In over 50 years, we're talking about six or eight cents, actually. Depends which chart you use and some other assumptions. But you need to understand this isn't a, a, a minimal thing. It's very, very substantial. And I, I, I chose not to resort to charts and graphs, but, but the, if you just look at the value of a dollar in 1940 terms, it's staggering. It's really shocking. This doesn't hit all people equally because if you're wealthy, you, there are maneuvers you can make. You can juggle things around to sort of stay abreast. But if you're someone at the bottom of the pyramid just trying to make it, it hits you the worst. For the middle class, often manage to roll some of your dollars into a, a tangible assets or income. The, tri the whole trick is to convert your labors and efforts into assets that can earn, not just assets you need to use, but assets you can earn. To the extent you can do that, you can start increasing your uh, handle on your, your, your income to deal with these things. Now, the thing that's the insidious part of inflation is that it destroys trust and faith in the government. It sets man against man, governments against go governments, and uh, it's a tactic also used by governments as a hidden way to force people to pay for programs they would not allow if direct taxation were demanded of them. And it's also a tactic used of those that wish to destroy one social order in order to build tyranny on the ashes of that destruction. And that's the history of mankind, and you, could go through, you, you can portray all of history in, in those terms, and you need to understand that to understand what's going on today. Hegel has said, uh, history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. Or George Santayana said it another way, he said that uh, anyone that doesn't know history is, is uh, doomed to repeat it. You need to understand that the most powerful tool of the, the would-be tyrants are not guns and ammo, it's uh, interest rates and debt and inflation. Uh, we're going to take a look at that. Now, one of the things that uh, we need to understand, because the Bible is going to talk prophetically about some things, we need to understand the dynamics of these things. Glo the global inflationary situation is the key uh, to understanding what the Bible is really talking about in the end times. And uh, for the first time in human history, universal inflation on the planet Earth is, is possible with all the currencies tied together and all, none of the currencies uh, with a sound basis, all of them being fiat currencies. And when you realize the implications of that, you'll begin to understand better what uh, Revelation 6 is probably alluding to here. Now, one of the things we've talked a little bit crudely, obviously, and superficially, from money to certificates of value, uh, one of the next things we want to talk about, obviously, as you start having transactions of these things, pretty soon there are services that you can benefit by, which leads to the advent of a bank that can store things for you, keep records for you, and also provide a, a, a number of services, valid services. But it turns out, out of the banking community emerges a practice a structure that very few people understand, but it's not complicated. It's called fractional reserve banking. Virtually all the economies in the world are inflationary because of the prevalence of that technique. Only Switzerland, and, not, uh, and only marginally, has its uh, currencies backed up by gold, but only partially. The only assets backing up your currency See, bear in mind, remember what currency was. It was a certificate as proof of ownership of some tangible asset, a bar of silver or something. And to, to, get convenient, to be convenient, they use certificates. But out of this, they've gotten to the point where the certificate is not backed by anything except other paper. But no one knows this. The reason we don't is because if I have one, you're perfectly willing to take it as we trade on something. Neither one of us, because we're too busy doing things, 
stop to realize, what are, we, what are we really dealing with? And it works as long as we have confidence, but we fail to recognize that confidence erodes in small pieces. And so we're dealing with a, with, with a slippery issue here. The actual mechanism of fractional reserve banking changes from country to country, but the, uh, the principles are all the same. The money is, by the bank is created out of thin air, no backing. It's loaned to people of the country who then must continually pay interest for the money that's been loaned. Uh, by the, the creating or, and or the lending institution. And it's a system in which people discover slowly that they have to run a little faster and faster to earn the same amount of buying power because the development of credit keep growing. And you're, as, as the credit grows, you've got to keep running hard to keep up with it. You'll see some examples as we go here. There are security problems with uh, physical money. Money has always been difficult to move around, particularly if there's too much of it. And so that leads, of course, to the idea of a bank. If you put on deposit some assets, and I was the banker, based on those assets, make loans to other people, because I could count on the fact that not everybody that has deposits with me are going to come at the same time. So it didn't take me long to figure out that I could make more loans than I have deposits. I can give these fancy names, but that's the net of it. That's where all the trouble really starts. A very simple form of banking was practiced by the ancient temples in uh, Egypt, Babylonia, and Greece which loaned at very high rates of interest and uh, you know, on the gold and, and silver uh, deposited for safekeeping. Private banking existed in 600 BC, well developed by the Greeks, Romans, and Byzantines. Medieval banking was dominated, strangely enough, by the Jews and Levantines because of the strictures of the Catholic Church against usury and because uh, many other occupations were closed to those people. So they, that was all that was available, so they developed expertise in them. The forerunners of modern banks were chartered for a specific purpose, the Bank of Venice, the Bank of England. They were chartered in connection with loans to the government and so forth. And I, I don't want to weary you with uh, too much of this history, but the point is, is that um, the recognition that not everybody would make a demand at the same time led to the opportunity that since few people ever came and asked for all their gold at one time, they could loan out the gold and silver to third parties, charge them interest for their, deposits, their depositors' money. They could loan it at a higher rate than they gave their depositors. In fact, in the early days, they even charged the depositors for storage. So you can see the picture. So that's, that, that's where they made their profit. At this point, let's talk about the early, current, the early United States. The currency of the United States really was, in, the, in those early days, the currency of last resort for the whole world. And so we're going to examine two meetings, fateful meetings, that uh, altered the course of history. Coming, the forthcoming euro in Europe may also be, turn out to be uh, a meeting, uh, an event of that same, that same weight. The American colonists originally had a disastrous experience with paper fiat money. It didn't have any credibility and it was a, it was a major, major disaster. In 1764, the British Parliament stepped in and outlawed irredeemable paper money in the colonies and immediately gold coins from Europe began circulating as money. The stability it provided, of course, uh, led to uh, a lot of progress and uh, a good fortune. But then came the Declaration of Independence, the War for Independence. In order to finance the war effort, the Continental Congress turned to the issuance of paper fiat money. Many of the colonists refused to accept the Continentals, as they were called, uh, these paper bills. And so the governments did what they always have done. They passed legal tender laws compelling people to accept the paper money, trying to make that work. And, of course, people who knew the difference between gold and paper money uh, continued to use the former and not the paper. They still have an expression you hear around, not worth a continental. It actually goes back to the Revolutionary War. It doesn't refer to Ford's car product. So um, one of the main points, finally, of the Continental Convention was uh, the need to ban the issuance of worthless paper money. The delegates finally decided to, to uh, bar the federal government from issuing paper money. From that day on, uh, and American Euro European bankers always sought to somehow create a central bank. And interestingly enough, as you read the history, people in those days were much more sophisticated than people today because the population in those days understood the dangers of having a dominant central bank. Today, most people aren't interested, they don't care, it's boring stuff, uh, not paying attention. They don't realize what the real dynamics are. By the way, Baron Nathan Meyer de Rothschild, Rothschild, or Rothschild as most people could say, uh, make, has a very interesting quote. He says, let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. See, he became powerful because he understood 
the dynamics of money. Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto said money plays the largest part in determining the course of history. He said, gee, check, why are we getting into all this? Because the Bible tells us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Paul warns us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. And unless you understand these devices, you will not understand history and therefore will not understand what's forthcoming. Let me give you an example of one who worked very, very hard at this area, a guy by the name of Abraham Lincoln. He worked hard to prevent the attempts of the Rothschilds, the European Rothschilds, to involve themselves in financing the Civil War. And interestingly enough, just a footnote you might find fascinating, it was the Tsar of Russia that provided the needed assistance against the British and the French who were going to uh, be the driving forces against the secession of the South and her subsequent financing. The Russians intervened by providing naval forces for the Union blockade of the South by letting both countries know, Britain and France, that if they attempted to join the Confederacy that they would have war with Russia. There's a fascinating irony of history that Russia was pivotal in helping establish or maintain, if you will, our Union. But anyway, the Rothschilds' interest did succeed, however, in, through an agent, Treasury Secretary Simon B. Chase, to force a bill called the National Banking Act through Congress creating a federally chartered central bank that had the power to issue U.S. banknotes. Now, here's the reason I'm bringing it up. Lincoln then warned the people as follows, quote, the money power preys upon the nation in the time of peace and it conspires against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. And that's selfish. I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of our country. Corporations have been enthroned. An era of corruption will follow. The money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until the wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed, close quote. He f continued to fight against the central bank and some historians now believe that it was his anticipated success in influencing the Congress to limit the life of the Bank of the United States to just the war years that was the motivating factor behind his assassination. Modern researchers have uncovered evidence of a massive conspiracy that links Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, to John Wilkes Booth, his eight co-conspirators, and 70 government officials uh, and businessmen uh, that were involved in the conspiracy with the Bank of Rothschild. When Booth's diary was recovered by Stanton's troops, it was delivered to Stanton. When it was later produced during the investigation, 18 pages had been ripped out. Those pages containing the previous, the names of the people I just ran off, were later found in the attic of one of Stanton's descendants. From Booth's trunk, a coded message was found that linked him directly to Judah B. Benjamin, a Civil War campaign manager for the South, the House of Rothschild. When the war ended, the key to the code was found in Benjamin's possession. Now, you know the story. The assassin was portrayed as a lone, crazed gunman. That's where the myth of the lone gunman began. It's a great, deep, long-standing American tradition. Okay? No, really. I'm, not, I'm sometimes flippant, but it's... Uh, the assassin, who was portrayed this way, was uh, a few of his radical friends, escaped by way of the only bridge in Washington not guarded by Stanton's troops. This guy, Booth, or whoever he really was, uh, was located... Uh, hiding in a barn near Port Royal, Virginia. Three days after escaping from Washington, he was shot by a soldier named uh, Boston Corbett who fired without orders. Whether or not the man was, that was killed was Booth is still a matter of contention, but the fact remains that whoever it was that uh, was killed, he had no chance to identify himself with the Secretary of War of Stanton that made the final determination. Some now believe that a dupe was used and that the real John Wilkes Booth escaped with Stanton's assistance. Mary Todd Lincoln, upon hearing of her husband's death, began screaming, oh, that dreadful house. And uh, earlier historians felt that this, was, this spontaneous utterance was uh, referred to the White House. Some now believe that it may have been directed to Thomas W. House, a gun runner, financier, and agent of the Rothschilds during the Civil War who was linked to the anti-Lincoln pro-banker interests. You say, well, gee, Chuck, that's just uh, that's an interesting episode in history. Let me move on.
Andrew Jackson was the first president west of the Appalachians. He was unique at the time for being the first, first one elected by voters um, without the direct support of a recognized political organization. He vetoed the renewal of the bank charter, uh, the charter for the Bank of the United States on July 10th of uh, 1832. In 1835, he declared his disdain for the international bankers. Quote, you are a den of vipers. I intend to rout you out. And by the eternal God, I will rout you out. If the people only understood the rank injustice of our money and banking system, there would be a revolution by morning. There followed an unsuccessful attempt to assassinate him. Jackson told his vice president, Martin Van Buren, the bank, Mr. Van Buren, is trying to kill me. So whether he's right or not, who knows, but J Jackson believed it was the bankers after him. Now you sort of wonder, is there a pattern here? Let's go on. James Garfield. President James a uh, Abram Garfield, our 20th president, had previously was chairman of the House Committee on Appropriations and was an expert in fiscal matters. Upon his election, among other things, he appointed an unpopular collector of customs in New York, whereupon two senators from New York, Roscoe Conkling and uh, Thomas Platt, uh, resigned their seats. President Garfield openly declared that whoever so whosoever controls the supply of currency would control business and activities of all the people. After only four months in office, guess what happened? President Garfield was shot at a railroad station on July 2, 1881. You might be interested to know that President John F. Kennedy planned to end the Federal Reserve. His plan to exterminate the Federal Reserve system ultimately and ultimately eliminate the national debt. He, did, he was trying to do the same thing that Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Jackson, and others before him, what they tried to do to the Rothschild uh, organized central banks. In 1963, by president, presidential order of John F. Kennedy, the United States Treasury, now understand the Constitution says only that the U.S. Treasury can print money. But the U.S. Treasury today doesn't. The Federal Reserve does, and they're not part of the government. So basically, it's, 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 it's passed as a law, 1913 Federal Reserve Act, but you need to understand there's a constitutional issue looking in the weeds here. But the point is, President Kennedy ordered the United States Treasury to begin printing United States notes. He had over $4 billion of these things printed and they were intended to replace the Federal Reserve notes. If you take a dollar out of your wallet, you'll see a, it's called a Federal Reserve note. It's not a U.S. dollar, it's a Federal Reserve note. That's not, that's a private corporation. Most people don't realize that. Kennedy had some printed that said U.S. United States notes. They look very similar. One side is identical, the other side has that distinctive feature. And it had a red star on it rather than a little green star or whatever. But, plan was when enough of these were in circulation, he would pull in the Federal Reserve notes and just declare the Federal Reserve obsolete. That's the way he would get these people out of our lives. That would end the control of the International Bank. Oh, by the way, Federal Reserve is also, uh, is the bank that is owned in large measure by internationalists, European bankers and others. These bills you'll still see in circulation. If you find one, grab it. You'll notice that by the little red mark on the dollar bill, you'll see United States notes. They're worth keeping as collector's items but you'll still find some in effect. They're in $2 or $5 denominations, typically. And they're printed in a series 1963 and a C on them. Douglas Dillon's uh, signature appears as Secretary of the Treasury, and the reverse side of these bills is identical to the Federal Reserve. Now, in put, after putting this plan into effect, just a few months later, President John F. Kennedy was professionally assassinated by a triangular fire in Dealey Plaza in Dallas. And of course, the professionalism of the execution isn't the uh, isn't the most incredible part. The amazing part of the whole story is the high level of coordination that was organized for the cover-up, which gives you some feeling for the power of the hidden government behind the scenes. And this cover-up was so successful, even to this day, very few Americans realize that there was a coup d'etat that was engineered to save the system. It, kind of a violent history. You know, we don't think of our history as being violent until recently, huh? Interesting. Now, obviously, for many years, authors have uh, attempted to sound the alarm that there exists a shadow government that actually rules America. And most of us dismiss all this stuff as conspiracy theory nuts, extremist, unrealistic. However, some time ago, I had an opportunity to have lunch with Otto von Habsburg. He's a member of the European Parliament. His father ruled, his father, grandfather, ruled uh, uh, Europe at the end of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, uh, he, um, made two remarks during the lights that caught my attention. The first one was, the ignorance in America is overwhelming. And I, th I knew what he meant, because if you 
if you travel in Europe, it's amazing how current they are on world affairs. And most of us in the United States, all we know are the, you know, what the ball scores were this past weekend. We don't pay attention. They do, because they know it's important. The second thing, though, he said, uh, I didn't understand at the time. He said, uh, the concentration of power in America is frightening. Now, at the time, I was chairman of the board of a, a multinational corporation. I thought I was well informed. I had an office in London. That's, and when I was trafficking as an executive, I've sat on 12 public boards of directors. I thought I was well informed. I, as I look back, I, was, I smile because I had, had, didn't have the foggiest notion what the world really was all about. And of course, since that remark, which bothered me, I started doing some homework, and that's part of the results of what you have here. Having spent three decades in international finance, I wish I had known back then what I know today. One of the things we're going to deal with here is one of the myths of America. Uh, one of the myths that you and I live with every day is a charade called the Federal Reserve, which is neither federal nor a reserve. The name was designed to deceive, and it still does. It's not federal. It's not owned by the federal government. It is privately owned. It pays its own postage like any other corporation. Its employees are not civil service. Its physical property is held under private deeds and is subject to local taxation. Government property is not. Are you with me? Okay. It's an engine that has created private wealth that is unimaginable even to the financially sophisticated. It has enabled an imperial elite to manipulate our economy for its own agenda, and it has enlisted the government as its enforcer. It controls the times, dictates business, affects our homes, and practically everything in which you and I are interested. And very few Americans understand where it came from, how it was the betrayal it involves was plotted at a meeting on Jekyll Island, Georgia, that was destined to defraud Americans of their wealth opportunity and would eventually lead to the subjugation of that great democratic experiment uh, that we live in today and it deferred to a centralized world government is where it's headed. It was, about 19, it was in November of 1910 at a New Jersey railway station on a bitterly cold evening the last southbound train rolled out. A special sealed railway car was attached to the end. Its gleaming black paint was accented with polished brass handrails, mahogany paneling, velvet curtains, plush armchairs, and a well-stocked bar. It belonged to Nelson Aldrich of Rhode Island. Very few people on the train realized who the passengers of that last car were. They represented in excess of one-fourth the wealth of the entire world. Among them were Nelson W. Aldrich, Senate Whip, Chairman of the National Monetary Commission and Business Associate of J.P. Morgan, father-in-law of John D. Rockefeller. Abraham Pyatt Andrew, Assistant Secretary of the United States Treasury. Frank A. Vanderlip, I'll come back to him, President of the National City Bank of New York, most powerful bank at that time, representing William Rockefeller and the International Investment Banking House of Kuhn Loeb & Company. Henry P. Davidson, senior partner of J.P. Morgan. Charles D. Norton, president of J.P. Morgan's First National Bank in New York. Benjamin Strong, head of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. Paul Warburg, key name a partner in Kuhn Loeb, and represented the Rothschild banking uh, dynasty in England and France, brother of Max Warburg, and who was the head of the Warburg Banking Consortium in Germany and the Netherlands. You following this? Interesting group of people. The destination of the train was Raleigh, North Carolina. From there, the last car of the train was detached and attached to a new train heading further south to the element destination of the small town of Brunswick, Georgia. From there, the, the group made its way to Jekyll Island by boat. And for many years after the event, educators, commentators, historians denied that the meeting at Jekyll Island ever took place, but even now the accepted view is that the meeting was relatively unimportant and only paranoid conspiracy theorists would try to make anything out of the meeting. However, the first leak regarding this meeting found its way into print in 1916. It appeared in Leslie's Weekly and was written uh, by a young financial reporter by the name of B.C. Forbes, who later founded Forbes magazine. The article is primarily in praise of Paul Warburg, and it's likely that Warburg left the story out during conversations with the writer. In 1930, Paul Warburg wrote a massive book, 1,750 pages, uh, entitled The Federal Reserve System, Its Origin and Growth. In his book, he describes the meeting and its purpose, and he goes, he did say, though 18 years have gone by, I do not feel free to give a description of the most interesting conference concerning which Senator Aldrich pledged all participants to secrecy. An interesting aspect of Paul Warburg's attention at the Jekyll Island meeting came 34 years later in a book written by his son James. In the book, he describes how his father, who did not know one end of a gun from another, borrowed a shotgun from a friend and carried it on the train to disguise himself as a duck hunter. And part of the story was narrated in the official biography of Senator Aldrich, written by uh, Nathaniel Wright Stevenson.
But finally, on February 9th of 1935, the Saturday Evening Post, of all places, an article appeared by one of the participants, Frank Vanderlip, in which he said, now I'm going to quote, Despite my views about the value of society of greater publicity for the affairs of corporations, there was an occasion near the close of 1910 when I was secretive, indeed as, indeed as furtive, as any conspirator. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together at the night of our departure. We were instructed to come one at a time and as unobtrusively as possible to the railroad terminal on the New York, Jersey literal of uh, Hudson, where Senator Alder's private car would be in readiness, attached to the rear end of a train for the South. Once aboard the private car, we began to observe the taboo that had been fixed on last names. We addressed one another as Ben, Paul, Nelson, Abe. It was Abraham, Piet, Andrew, and Davidson, and uh, Davidson and I adopted even deeper disguises, abandoning our first names on the theory that we were always right, we became Wilbur and Orville, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, the servants of the train crew may have known the identities of one or two of us, but they did not know all, and it was the names all printed together that would have made our mysterious journey significant in Washington, in Wall Street, and in London. Discovery we knew must not happen, else all our time and effort would have been wasted. If we were to be exposed publicly that our particular group got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have had no chance whatever of passing through Congress. And uh, now, of all the personalities on Jekyll Island, Colonel Edward Mandel House is probably the most important. He was the key driving force behind the formation of the Federal Reserve and was also the hidden power behind President Woodrow Wilson. And Colonel House wrote a novel entitled Philip Drew Administrator in which he promotes socialism and so forth in which the events are manipulated behind the scenes to overthrow an existing government. That's his mindset. See? It was that same Edward Mandel House who nine years later arranged a dinner meeting with the British and American notables in the Majestic Hotel in Paris on the evening of May 30th, 1919. At that meeting, those present founded the Royal Institute of International Affairs in England and the Institute of International Affairs in the United States. Two years later, the U.S. organization was renamed the Council for Foreign Relations. Uh, which ultimately came to dominate U.S. State uh, Department policy as it does today. It, its purpose was to the fulfillment of the socialist ideal of the establishment of the Anglo-American dominated global government. And it's also noteworthy that another one at the uh, Majestic Hotel was John Maynard Keynes, the Fabian socialist economist, who was one of the driving engines at the Bretton Woods Conference, and I'll come to that shortly. Anyway, the, by 1922, of course, the CFR was calling for world government solution to global problems. And uh, I won't go through all that. I think most of you probably are well, well aware of its, its orientation and its agenda. But the main challenges facing the group at Jekyll Island were several. How to stop the growing influence of small rival banks to ensure that the control of the nation's financial resources would remain in the hands of those present, which of course were New Yorkers. How to make the money supply elastic in order to reverse the trend of private capital formation and to recapture the industrial market. People had discovered that instead of borrowing from banks, which is a standard way, they, corporations could float their own securities. And that was more practical for lots of reasons, and yet that's a threat to the bankers, so they had to deal with that. They also want to figure out how to pull the meager reserves of the nation's banks into one large reserve so that all banks would be motivated to follow the same loan to deposit ratios, which would protect at least some of them from currency drains and bank runs. In other words, establish a cartel. And if you've got a lot of independent banks, uh, they can compete. We don't want them to compete, we want to control it. Fourth item is that uh, should all this eventually lead to the collapse of the whole banking system, they want to know how to shift those losses from the owners of the banks to the taxpayers themselves. Okay, that was the goal. With all of that, they also need to figure out how to convince the Congress that the scheme was a measure, get this, to protect the public. And out of this, of course, came an ingenious design. You know, the only thing that's more insidious than allowing a government just to print paper money is to have the government set up a private corporation that will print the money and lend it to them on interest. If we get the, in other words, not only is the money worthless, there is a debt bearing interest involved. And where did the money come from? Out of thin air. And you say, this is preposterous. No one could pull off a thing like that. Hey, they did, and they're continuing to. You need to understand that dynamic, because that dynamic is operating now on an international level. If you understand what's behind it, you understand that the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, what it really is, what the World Bank is really doing, then you can begin to assess the damage it's causing globally. The damage is not accidental, 
It's part of the agenda. The Federal Reserve was created to stabilize the economy. One of the most widely used textbooks says, quote, it sprang from the panic of 1907 with its alarming epidemic of bank failures. The country is fed up once and for all with all the anarchy of unstable private banking. Well, let's consider its performance since then. By the way, all that's a poppycock. There was a sh they actually stalled the vote until three days before Christmas, or no, between Christmas and the 27th of December, when no one was around. I, I, all the Congress had gone home. And that's when they slipped it through, all by design. This whole thing's a fraud. Anyway, since the creation, Federal Reserve has presided over the crashes of 1921, 1929, the Great Depression of 29 and 39, the recessions of 1953, 1957, 1969, 1975, 1981, the stock market's Black Monday of October 87, 1,000% inflation, which has destroyed 90% of the dollar's purchasing power. Was that a, is that a track record? Does that mean they failed? Does it seem, no, the painful answer is, Protect the public was never its true objectives. Once you realize the circumstances under which it was created, the nature of those who authored it, and study its actual performance over the years, it becomes obvious that the system is merely a cartel with a government facade. There's no doubt that those who run it are motivated to maintain full employment, high productivity, low inflation, generally sound economy, but they're not interested in killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. Beautiful eggs they are. There's a conflict which arises almost every day, and in those conflicts, you can guarantee that ultimately the public is the one that's sacrificed. Let's, let's talk about how it works, because most people don't understand that. Under fractional reserve banking, money is not created until the instant it is borrowed. It is the actual act of borrowing that causes the money to spring into existence. It's the act of paying off a debt that causes the money to vanish. See, money today has no gold or silver backing on it. And the fractional backing is not 54% or 15%, it is 0% in terms of backing. The dollar has traveled the same path that all currency has of this kind in history. And the so-called reserves in which the reserve ratios are fixed are themselves other certificates of debt. There's no real money anywhere in the picture, it's all paper. In spite of all the technical jargon and complicated procedures, the actual mechanism by which the Federal Reserve creates money is really quite simple. It's done exactly the same way the goldsmiths of old, except the, old, the goldsmiths of old were limited to need hold some precious metal of reserve, in reserve. But the Fed has no such restriction. The banks create money based on the primary borrower's promise to pay, essentially an IOU. The banks create money by monetizing the private debts of businesses and individuals. And what makes this, all this paper uh, have any value whatsoever? Uh, simply because people have confidence that it will be accepted in exchange. The entire function of the, federal, the fractional reserve machine is to convert debts to money. And let's use the United States as our example. There are similar me me mechanisms in other countries. The federal government prints impressive papers with patterns on them and, and uh, calls them bonds or treasury notes. These are merely a promise to pay a specified sum at an uh, unspecified interest at some, at, at some specified date. Uh, excuse me, the bills have... Uh, no debt, no, I mean, no, uh, no interest and no date. The debt eventually becomes a foundation for almost all the entire nation's money supply. It essentially has created cash, doesn't look like cash. To convert these paper bills and checkbook money, we have to, is the function of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve takes all the government bonds which the public does not buy and writes a check to Congress in exchange for them. It may acquire other debt obligations as well, and that's the scary part, because they can also buy foreign debt, although the bonds represent most of the Fed's, the Fed's inventory. There's no money to back up the Federal Reserve, what it writes. It writes checks on these. There's no cash yet, no real, what you and I would consider real money yet. It's creating money out of thin air on the spot. The Federal Reserve treats those bonds as assets, calling them reserves, which it again uses the basis for loaning money to its member banks. The money created for the bonds is given to the government to be spent by the government in a circulation to support its social programs and whatever else. So the first wave of money uh, goes into circulation. Then the bonds held by the Fed become the basis of all bank loans made by the nation's businesses and individuals. The result of this process is the same as creating money on a printing press, but the illusion is based on an accounting trick and has more, more official luck. The bottom line is the Congress and the Federal Reserve banking cartel have entered into a partnership in which the cartel has the privilege of collecting interest on the money it creates out of nothing,
giving the Fed a perpetual override on every American dollar that exists in the world. At the same time, the Congress has access to unlimited funding without having to tell the voters that their taxes were raised by inflation without them knowing it. If you understand this last paragraph, you understand the entire Federal Reserve system. There are three ways that the Federal Reserve creates fiat money out of government debt. One is by making loans to member banks, which is called the discount window. Second is by purchasing treasury bonds and other certificates of debt in what's called the open market committee. The third is by charging so-called reserve ratio that member banks are required to hold. Each action is a different path on essentially the same objective, taking IOUs and converting them into spendable money. What the Fed really does, its primary throttle on all of this, it controls the expansion of credit in the United States. Any government debt to the bank is considered an asset because it's assumed that the government will keep its promise to pay. This is based upon its ability to obtain whatever money it needs through taxation. That's what's called, especially in international circles, sovereign risk. The theory is that if a foreign government is a reliable borrower because they can presumably tax their people to all make good the thing. That, of course, is pretty flaky reasoning, but that's the basis upon which it's all built. So the Federal Reserve can use these assets to expand the credit, and I won't go through all the other uh, things except to recognize there's no real money behind this. These are all bookkeeping entries. There is um, a tax, then, on all of us beyond the taxes you pay on April 15th. Over the years of our lifetimes, without realizing it, we all will pay, in addition to our federal income taxes and excise taxes, a completely hidden tax of approximately uh, 10 times the national debt. That debt is getting monetized. Now, that's not the end of it. Since our money supply can be, is truly an arbitrary entity with nothing backing it except debt, its size can go down as well as up. When people are going deeper into debt, the nation's money supply expands and prices rise. When they pay off their debts and re or refuse to borrow, the money supply contracts and prices tumble. And that can be a deflationary thing. And uh, many, people have, many people who have been in business for many, many decades have no concept of how to operate in a de deflationary situation. And we may be facing one of those coming. Now, of course, all the benefits of this do not go to the citizens who are stuck in the system. They only go to the politicians, the partnership between the politicians and the bankers. In the Monetary Control Act of 1980, it made it possible for the Federal Reserve to monetize, as they call it, any debt instrument, including IOUs from foreign governments, and that's a heavy trip. Uh, the apparent purpose of this legislation was to make it possible, make possible the bailout of governments having trouble paying the interest on their loans in American banks when the Federal Reserve creates fiat American dollars to give American, uh, foreign governments. In exchange for further worthless bonds, the money path gets slightly longer and a little more twisted. But the effect's the same, as if they bought treasury bonds. The name of the game is to keep the interest payments flowing, and that's what's called euphemistically a bailout. What we're going to do, now I've, I've bored you for a period of time here on the mechanics, and I've spared you perhaps maybe more better, better models, but hope I got the idea across. You say, gee, Chuck, what's this all got to do? Hang on, uh, because in the next session, you, you'll be shocked and surprised to realize how this fraud that started from our point of view at Jekyll Island, how it unravels, not just for us, but how this has now been escalated another notch up to set the stage for global tyranny and global famine. Now it gets really exciting. As we look at the current issues of warfare, both as they're considered biblically and prophetically, uh, and also the wars of the 20th century, it is impossible.